Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Lori Hartshorn. I am so glad you joined us today. We invite you on a journey of faith. You're going to see two powerful stories where prayer changed hopeless situations. Mike shares how a miracle saved not only his life, but his friends after their boat capsized in alligator-infested waters. You'll also meet one couple who for nine years tried everything to get pregnant. See how the prayers of a pastor set the stage for an ultimate surprise. But first, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Gary Nelson, President and Vice Chancellor of Tyndale University College and Seminary, which is celebrating its 125th anniversary this year. Dr. Nelson and I will be discussing the legacy of this incredible Christian university. Let's meet Dr. Nelson. Well, I'm so glad you're here, Gary. Nice to have you uh, with us and yeah. to hear more of your story because I get to see you in action at Tyndale and uh, you're doing a great job there as, a, Thank you. as the president. Tell me a little bit about your own faith journey. Oh gosh, my journey, uh, I grew up in church, but uh, when I went off to university, I was on a football scholarship and, and probably trying to find faith for myself and yeah. uh, came to faith in, my first year of university. Wow. It was, and it wasn't because I felt any kind of sense of, well, this is terrible to say sinfulness, but more of a, a, a sense of a lack of purpose. Right. And a lack of, of, an, yeah. of just direction. And I, and I think that's exactly what happened for me. My call to ministry, all of those things happened almost at the same time. Wow. And at that time I was studying phys ed. So, really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So that's probably why you have such a heart and connection for university students. I do. I love yeah. students. Yeah. I've, I And I've been one of the ones that didn't do well oh, in yeah. my first year yeah. because yeah. I was too busy partying. So, oh, my. <laughs> yeah. so that once you got past the, you found the Lord yeah. and you got your calling. So what was that lead into ministry? What did that how did your journey then unfold? It was just, uh, I was a, I grew up in a downtown church, and most of my ministry has been in our urban church yeah. renewal kind of situations. Yeah. And at the same time, my background in terms of my studies was urban missiology. So what does it mean to be the church in the city? So, wow. so it's been a lot of fun over the years. So, yeah. yeah, well, I really appreciate your story. And um, I had the privilege then of reading your book, Leading in Disorienting Times. Right. I'm a passionate about leadership. <laughs> I've worked for John Maxwell and I've spent right. a lot of time myself uh, leading and learning leadership, which is endless. And your book stood out to me so much, Gary, I found, and Peter Dickens, who you wrote it with, right, right. which I knew as well. It was a unique leadership book. Now, I know you want me to say that, right? No, actually, I, I appreciate you saying oh, that. We, we did try, we, we tried to kind of make it accessible yeah. to kind of people, anybody. You well, know. it is, and it's. I, there were so many things that stood out in that book to me that many leadership books have been written, as you know. Right, right. right? right. But tell me a little bit about when you wrote this book. Like, what led you to writing Leading in Disorienting Times? Well, part of it was because Peter, at that time, Peter was quite sick, and actually Peter passed away a year after the book came out. Yeah. But uh, he was an amazing... He was talking about complexity theory when everybody else was still just talking about leadership. Okay, and, complexity theory. Well, it's Break the idea down, It's it's the idea that we no longer live in, in kind of times, like a simple challenge would be like baking bread. If you follow the formula, you follow the recipe, it works. Mm -hmm. A complicated problem would be, you know, you'd still have a formula, like building a rocket ship. Mm -hmm. And if you build that, you know, there's still formulas, but if you do it right, the rocket ship will fly. But a complex problem is, is like raising a family. Mm. And and there's no rules. The, the 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 kids are different. You know all of those different kinds of things, mm -hmm. uh, and the rules change. And so and I think we in the church love the idea of simple solutions mm -hmm. to to complex problems. And so as we tried to look at the book, we wanted to provide help for people to to understand the times that we live in. It yes. feels chaotic. It yes. feels disorienting. But how do you begin to create a, a kind of framework that helps you as a leader right. 
um, try things, fail? I mean, how do you say that it's okay? It's okay to fail. We yeah. we built. I mean, I met lots of church planters who wanted to do really creative things, but they were afraid because their denomination wouldn't let them fail. But how else are you going to figure that out? Right, so, right. so that was the challenge for us. And so we thought yeah. this was the kind of book that was needed. Well, I, I really appreciate not only the deeply biblical richness of the book, but the practicalness of the book. Mm. And and as you know, I had an assignment in my class. Yeah. <laughs> so I wrote a paper on your book. Yep. Do you want to give me an A right yeah, now? Yeah, right before? now. No. <laughs> um, but here's some of the, as you said, this is something that really stood out to me. And I've read a lot of leadership right. books, Gary, and I've learned a lot of hard leadership lessons. Sure, sure. But this this idea of emergent self-organization. Right. I mean, this is actually deeply biblical, but explain to us, what do you mean by that? Like, why? how is that any different than the way we've run or led organizations before? Well, I, I think in, in, uh, in the past, uh, leadership happened from the top down. Okay. And, and, and you shaped a form and a framework. And, and what's happening now is in these emergent forms is they actually self-organize. And how do you allow that to take place? And, mm -hmm. and, and how do you not control it? I mean, we always talk about right. allowing the spirit to work, but we would really like the spirit to do it the way we would we feel wanted. most comfortable, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and so how do you allow the forms and the frames yeah. to actually emerge and to get and and part of leadership in this day and age is to then how do you fan the flame yeah. when you see it beginning to emerge without without quenching it? And, and it's in, it, uh, underneath all of that, I see this empowering model of leadership that Jesus mm -hmm. had, right? Mm -hmm. That he he just was like empowered you not only through the gifts and mm -hmm. the spirit, but like as an organization working together and fanning into flame the gifts that are and the people that are under you. And right. it's not just a team mentality. But it's truly that emerging the what the group of people that you right. have around you. And, and churches are so nervous because they think they're losing control. Yes. But in truth, what's actually happening is the, the principles, the themes are probably the same. Yeah. But the difference is that it'll take different forms yeah. for the different times that we're in. And I think that's the mm -hmm. challenge for leadership. Like people will often say to me, well, you really, you know, you got everything that you wanted. Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is when you lead, you're actually learning how to listen to other people yes. and allow them to shape what yeah. the vision might look like. And then you get better ownership. I agree. And I've watched you model that. Uh, really, leadership is stooping down mm -hmm. and lifting other people up. Mm -hmm. And I see you as a good listener. And people, more problems are solved if we let more voices at the table. I could have come to this more often. Well, there You're you go. I'll nice. make you feel really good. Let me, <laughs> let me, this one quote just hit me so hard. We all talk about servant leadership and yeah. we believe in it as believers because that's what Jesus was. But you said in your book, each one of us has an audience of significance right. to which we play our lives, deciding who the audience will be is critical because it will be the approval of that audience that will matter most to us. It will be the values and priorities of that audience of choice that will emerge. Yeah. So who's your audience as a leader, well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that becomes the challenge. You, yeah. you see it in pastor's conferences. Um, is your audience God? Yeah. Or, or is your audience the significant, the, the other pastors who want right. you to, to want to be the successful one in the room. Right. And how do you lay that aside yeah. and actually become a leader yeah. that leads the way God has called you? Yeah. Transactional leadership versus transformational leadership. Absolutely. What what give me give me your insight on that. Why is that so important? Uh because it makes all the difference. Transactional is about making a deal. Transformational is that we both get changed in yeah. the process. I That's get changed so because you bring something into the to being. That's so good. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your book. Where can people find it? Uh, they can find it on Amazon. They can get it from our the bookstore at Tyndale. So yeah. it's it's available everywhere. That's great. Well, I know I have it on my Kindle. That's why it's not in my hands today. But yeah. you can get it in your hands if you go to Amazon yeah. or to Tyndale.ca. And it's a wonderful book. It's blessed me. It's encouraged me as a leader. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now this is the story of the mirror moonlight rescue in alligator infested waters. Wow. He never answered me. I was convinced that he was gone. There was no doubt in my mind that I killed my friend. And I was, it, it, uh, 
is a bad feeling. Friday night of Father's Day weekend 2016, Mike Turner got a late night urgent phone call from his grandson Landon asking for help. He said, uh, me and daddy's frogging at Rudock and we broke down and he to come get me. I said, all right, I'm gonna call your other papa and get him to ride with me so I don't have to come by myself in the middle of the night. And he said, okay, so I hung up. Soon after, Mike picked up Billy, Landon's other grandfather who had been in poor health since he had open heart surgery. They launched Mike's boat after midnight in the swamps near Baton Rouge and began searching for Landon's disabled boat. It was a bright moonlit night, so I didn't use my light to drive the boat. And uh, you can see pretty good, but there were some stumps in the water that we could not see. They were submerged about six inches. We were running about 38 miles an hour the last time I looked, and then, and then bam, big bang. And all I knew is it was dark. I couldn't see and couldn't breathe. Didn't know which way was up. Didn't know what happened. And I hit my head on something, and it was the steering wheel of my boat. Then I realized we'd flipped the boat. Mike was trapped under the boat, and Billy was nowhere to be seen. And when I got my bearings back, I started hollering for Billy. And I hollered about three times. He never answered me. And uh, I just knew there was no doubt in my mind. He was, he was gone. Billy had been tossed from the boat. He wasn't wearing a life jacket, and his rubber boots pulled him under. He struggled to breathe and prayed for his life. My boots felt like two cinder blocks pulling me down. I said, Lord, if you don't get my head above water, you can take me home now, because I'm, I'm spent. The stamina is gone. And it was just like he put his hands under my boots and just raised me up. Mike could now see Billy struggling about 40 feet from the boat. He was wearing out quick, and he told me he wasn't hurt, but he wasn't going to last much longer with these boots on. So I swam back under the boat, unlocked the compartment, got the life jackets out. Well, he threw a life jacket that landed about four foot from him, and it was all I could do to get to the life jacket. Mike was able to reach Billy and slowly pulled him back to the boat. They rested together on the capsized hull, both thankful to be alive. How we made it through the initial wreck without getting hurt only God knows. That's, that's the only thing that, uh, that's the only thing you can be. They tried to signal trucks on a nearby overpass with Mike's flashlight, but no one stopped. When he shone his light in the water, it revealed a new problem. He said, look over your left shoulder. So I turned my head and looked, and there was three alligators, like forming a semicircle, about 10 or 15 feet from the boat. And he says, uh, now look over your right shoulder. So I look over my right shoulder, and there was three more. This is 1.30 in the morning, and it's their feeding time. They're nocturnal. And it was just making me nervous, because when I started shining the bank, there was tons of them on the bank. And they were all coming in the water. Coming, they were curious as to what we were doing and what we were, as if we had food for them. Those alligators had me thinking they were coming to get us. And I've, I've been around gators all my life, but never in a situation like that. I was doing some heavy, heavy, heavy praying to myself while I was in that water, asking God, please get me out of this. While they waited and prayed, Mike later found out Landon was also praying. He said, God, please help me get this motor started, because he knew something had happened to us. It'd been hours, and we hadn't shown up yet. So, but they didn't know what. So after he, as soon as he said that, next time he tried to crank the motor, it cranked. Landon drove back towards the boat launch. Around 3.30 in the morning, Billy saw a light on the water as Landon's boat slowly approached. I wanted to cry when I saw him. It was, it was very uh, emotional. I think we'd have been there all night and I did not want to spend all night there. You know, it's just, they were God sent. Once back on shore, they knew God had answered their prayers as they tested Landon's motor. I said, Landon, crank that motor, see if it'll crank. And it was locked up, it wouldn't turn over. So you tell me what it was. There's no doubt in my mind what it was. Nobody will ever change my mind. It was God, it was God. That Sunday after church, Mike and Billy gathered with their family and celebrated Father's Day thankful God was with them in their time of need 
and had heard their prayers. It was good. It was almost like a first Father's Day I ever had. It, to me, it was like a rebirth. The good Lord had given me a second chance because Mike and I both could have lost our lives the night before, and Landon would have lost both his grandfathers at the same time. And so everybody was very, very joyous over what had happened, how it ended up. And it, it brought my family closer together, made them realize that you can be here today and be gone. It might not be a tomorrow. I look forward to every day thanking him for what he's done, what he's going to do, and what he hadn't done yet. Jesus Christ was watching over us, right? You could almost feel him when we were in that water. I knew he was helping us. And uh, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here talking to you right now. No, wow. You know what? That is an amazing testimony because uh, he said those alligators are nocturnal, and it was feeding time. I, I love how Billy said, uh, my, my legs felt like cinder blocks, and I was going down, Lord, if you don't help me, you're going to have to take me home right now. Landon would have lost both of his grandfathers that, that day, but it really sobered them. You know, I, I'm laughing a bit because it reminds me of my own dad as well because, you know, as, a, as an older uh, gentleman, he would say some very similar things like that. <laughs> he said, it ain't no fun when the rabbits got the gun. You know, when you're in the water and now you're in crocodile-infested waters, you know you need a miracle, and that was a miracle. But what's not a funny and a laughing matter, you might be in that situation right now and you're saying, God, I'm going down for the count. I believe that God has a miracle for you. You know, the Bible says that in Matthew 14, 30, that Peter was in a very similar situation and he was sinking and he cried out the shortest prayer in the Bible, Lord, save me. And God saved him. I wonder if that's where you are right now. I want to get something into your hands. It doesn't cost you anything, but... Uh, it will help you if you're looking for a lifeline. Call the number on the screen after we pray this prayer, one 855 700 and uh, believe God. Father, I thank you for your, your child. Now pray this prayer. Jesus, I surrender. Help. In Jesus' name, amen. Simple prayer. Call the number, one 855 700 and now, this is one prayer that changed everything for two very thankful parents. <laughs> I would write in my journal about having a girl, combing her hair, and us dressing alike. I would write about meeting her and what it would be like to have a daughter. Davida Daniels always wanted to be a mom. At 22, she started journaling about her desires to have a child right before she was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, a hormonal imbalance that causes infertility. They gave me the details of what it meant for my body and how the chances of me having children will be very slim. It was very discouraging. And painful. Now married to Tyrone, Davida wanted a hysterectomy, but Tyrone still hoped to have children of his own. She became angry because she said, I'm sick of the pain. I'm sick of dealing with these issues. I want to have this procedure done right now. I said, if you can just give me a little bit of time and just let God work, I believe that he can heal you and we can have children. Tyrone convinced Davida to try to have children, but the odds only got worse. At 26, Davida learned she was in early menopause and doctors told them any chance of getting pregnant were gone. Even then, Tyrone held on to a hope. Tyrone always believed and he always had the faith to push me. My faith was down. I just, I had no more faith because I had dealt with it for so long and I was fed up. At times, the couple went to the baby store to stay focused on the promise of having a child. I would just browse at nursery beds, look at clothes. It gave me hope to know that one day this, this will be me. 
that Daniels tried for nine years to conceive but had no success. Then, in 2016, the couple were at a hotel when Tyrone met an evangelist in the parking lot who asked if he needed prayer for anything. I said to him, well, my wife and I are trying to have a child and she's in the car right now. Do you mind praying for her? He prayed for God's will to be done. I remember he said whether it's spring, summer, winter, or fall, to give us a baby. A month later, Davida went to her OBGYN doctor after she woke up feeling nauseated. At once, the doctor ordered blood work. The doctor comes in and say, congratulations. And I looked and I said, congratulations. And the doctor said, well, were you trying to get pregnant? Because you're pregnant. And I stopped. I'm what? At that time, I was just numb. I was wow. Unable to grasp what she was told, Davida bought a home pregnancy test. It was positive. At once, she called Tyrone. I just kept telling the Lord, thank you for honoring your promise. Thank you for not leaving me in that place of despair and hopelessness. Thank you for blessing us with a child. Months later, the couple went to the doctor to see their baby for the first time. When the lady said it was a girl, I was excited. I was ready to go to the store and go shopping <laughs> right then. We would hear the heartbeat. We would see her hands and her feet moving, and I would just get so excited. I would say, God, thank you so much for this baby girl. And it just took me to a place of just joy. Then on June 28, 2017, Lauren Danae Helen met her parents. When I first held her, I looked at her and I just said, hi, Lauren. I remember kissing her. It was just so amazing to know that something you pray for for nine years, just you're holding it in your arms. It's just, it was just beautiful. That was a very special day. When I saw her pop up from behind that sheet, I knew that God didn't lie to me. I knew that God didn't forget about me. I knew that she was here for a reason, and it was amazing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. The Daniels have been enjoying every moment with Lauren as she celebrated her second birthday. As I used to journal and, and write about dressing her up, I, I love for us to dress alike and to wear the matching dresses and combing her hair and her looking in the mirror and saying, oh, that's pretty, that is just. She sings all the time. She likes to run and play. She jumps up in my arms and gives me kisses and gives me hugs and just says, daddy, 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 just says it over and over again. All of those things, it just, makes me more in love with her each day. You have to trust him. No matter how you feel, no matter what you may be going through, God is able to fulfill his promises. The greatest revelation that God has given me is to just hold on. If he promised it, it will happen. Yeah. Uh... Wow, what a beautiful story this is. I tell you, he was a good man, Tyrone. He just kept faithfully believing and praying and asking God and inviting other people to pray. And God did, after nine years, bless them with a child. You know, there's a theme of persevering prayer in scripture. So often we think, well, if I just maybe pray a few prayers, you know, I'm gonna get my answer. But a lot of our life, including my own, is a lesson in persevering prayer. In fact, when my kids were running from the Lord, it was seven years of praying before we saw God answer for our first child to return. Let me remind you in the book of Revelation, the, the last book at, at the end of scripture, there's this incredible throne room in heaven scene. And God is on the throne and before him are presented these beautiful golden bowls and they're full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You know, as this beautiful incense really rises up right in the nostrils of God, he loves our prayers, he hears our prayers. We're reminded that in his time that he tips that bowl over 
and answers our prayers. You know that the people in the book of Revelation, the time it was written, they were suffering for their faith. They were under deep persecution. And one of their prayers was, how long, O Lord, how long? It's a theme right through the book. And at the end of the book, we know the end, it's a good one. Jesus said, I will come, I will come. And I can just tell you today, God's coming for you. He's heard your prayer. So keep on praying, persevere, don't give up. He hears you. We'll be right back. We are on an urgent mission here at the 700 Club Canada to use the power of media to share the good news of Jesus. Will you join us in this critical time by helping us reach more people with the best news in the world? Would you prayerfully consider giving at one of our monthly partner levels? Or maybe you can give a generous annual gift today. Call now, 1-855-759-0700, or you can give online at 700club.ca. Hey, let's do this together. Lord, this whole time we've been talking about unwavering faith. And, you know, when I was looking at Mike and Billy, that was a modern-day Daniel in the lion's den. Mm. Well, I'll tell you the stories we've heard today. And even, yeah. even the privilege of interviewing Gary Nelson, like, yeah, faithfulness, unwavering faith, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a leader in our country. Yeah. And we need to see many, many more of, the, of uh, those of us follow in faithfulness absolutely. as we absolutely. lead. Absolutely. Right, yeah. But we also have some prayer requests as we well. We do, yeah. From Rosemary in BC. She's praying for peace in her family and for her to have stronger faith. That's a good prayer request, yeah. Yeah, it's a great prayer. And yeah. Bonnie in Nova Scotia, she's praying for yeah. peace and strength. And, you know, with these prayer requests, also realize each day we are Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're plugging in because we want to keep praying for you. Let's yeah, touch and absolutely. agree. absolutely. Well, I am going to pray from sea to shining sea, Brian. All right. From BC to Nova Scotia. Let's do it. Yeah, Father, I pray for peace yeah. and strength yes. in families across our land, mm -hmm. that you would hear the prayers of uh, these women as well as many, many families that need your peace. So we welcome you, Lord Jesus, to just bust into homes and just reveal your presence to yeah. them and may people receive you and turn to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, we are praying for strength as well. Mm -hmm. Lord, you know that... Uh, our, our strength is imperfect, but your strength is perfect and nothing is impossible with you. So we touch and agree and we yeah. say in Jesus' name, yeah, it's good. amen. Amen. First Chronicles, First Chronicles 16, 11 to 12, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. Wow, stand on that. Until next time, God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.